my name is Dave Loomis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Regulatory Policy Studies here at Illinois State University. The Institute was founded in 1997 uh, with a threefold purpose to support our master's degree program in electricity, natural gas, and telecommunications economics, to do public education and outreach, and to do applied research in public policy matters. As part of our education and outreach mission, we've created these video podcasts. And each month we're going to sit down with a key policy decision maker in Illinois that helps shape the innovative regulatory environment uh, that we have here in Illinois. So I hope you enjoy each one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for coming in and, and uh, joining our discussion here. Happy to be here. Why don't you tell me about uh, um, your present position and then where you've been. Uh, um, how how has your career uh, developed uh, over, the, <laughs> o over the years? Well, it's kind of been a hopscotch affair, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, right now I'm consulting. Uh, after I left the commission uh, in March of 2012, mm -hmm. I, I started my own consulting firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've been uh, consulting since then, enjoying that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting endeavor. I get to work <laughs> in my shorts and t-shirt a lot, so uh, it's much more casual. Um, how I got into this uh, regulatory niche uh, is kind of an interesting. I was, uh, I went back to college sort of late in life, in my mid to, mid 30s, in 1988, at uh, what was uh, then called Sangamon State University, mm -hmm. and I got my bachelor's degree in economics in 1990, uh, and. Uh, some folks there asked me to uh, apply to the Government Public Service Internship Program, which I did. I was accepted. And uh, as part of that process, you know, the state agencies that are interested in having economists uh, work in their agencies uh, submit their applications. I had seven different applications for seven different agencies, hmm. two of which were uh, at the ICC. Luckily, I think. <laughs> uh, I took the uh, took the gig at the ICC. Mm -hmm. So for two years, I worked as a as an intern, um, which is full time during the summer and then half time during the school year. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1992, uh, as I was finishing my coursework, uh, I uh, was asked to stay on the commission as a, as a regular employee, which I did. I started in the cost of service and rate design department. Mm -hmm. um, so when was that that you transitioned? That would have been 1992. Okay. Uh, so mm -hmm. 90 to 92, I was an intern. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as, a, as an intern, I was, I think, given much more responsibility than, a, uh, say, a, a young 18 to 22 year old <laughs> college student. Uh, mm -hmm. I was made case manager of a of a rate case, for example, oh, wow. and mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I guess because I was older, uh, I had a little more, uh, who knows, gray hair, I guess. <laughs> so I started in 92 in the cost of service uh, and rate design department, uh, public utilities division, and uh, during the period from 92 to 96 when I left and went to work for the uh, commissioner's office as an assistant, uh, a lot of folks came through there. Uh, mm -hmm. Terry Harville, for one, uh, mm -hmm. uh, commissioner. Eventually, uh, Carl Peterson mm -hmm. uh, was also came through the rates department. Uh, so there was a there was a bunch of us uh, mm -hmm. that that uh, worked our way through and then out of the, the cost of service and uh, and then I went to work uh, as an assistant to Commissioner Brent Bolin in '96 and. Uh, Eventually, uh, Brent was not reappointed, mm -hmm. and uh, Ed Hurley came on and took his place. I worked for Ed uh, for some period of time. Uh, he eventually became chairman of the commission. And then my last commissioner that I worked for was Mary Frances Squires. That's somewhat unusual. Uh, I don't know whether it was unusual in that history, but it, it tended to be if, if um, you were a commissioner's assistant, the new commissioner that yeah. would get appointed would would bring in their um, yeah. uh, their own uh, assistants rather than um, uh, an existing uh, assistant that was yeah that, uh, that's was pretty much the case. Uh, in fact, uh, 
when Ed came on, uh, Ed Hurley, I uh, suggested that, you know, maybe 30 days or so, whatever transition you need until you mm -hmm. can, uh, but we were in the middle at that time of the SBC Ameritech merger case. Mm. And I think uh, uh, at the time, Ed wanted to keep me on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because of my institutional knowledge. Uh, and, and then when Commissioner Squires came onto the commission, um, she was based in Springfield, where I was. Ed was based in Chicago. And I was helping her interview candidates to be her assistant. And mm -hmm. she basically said, well, I don't need that guy. I need someone like you. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I said, well, uh, why don't I go to work for you? Ed really didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I transitioned over to her. And yeah, it, it was interesting. It, uh, I had three different commissioners. I did that for almost uh, eight years. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I, and I think still is, a, a record for mm -hmm. assistants. Yeah. Um, I worked for commissioners of different parties, uh, different mm -hmm. genders, mm -hmm. uh, different levels of institutional knowledge of, of, mm -hmm. of commission history, and um, so it was uh, it was quite uh, educational and informative. And Two questions: mm -hmm. As a commissioner's assistant, um, uh, a lot of commissioners' assistants have a legal background as opposed to an economics um, uh, background, uh, but. Um, could you describe what what does a commissioner's assistant do? Um, what, you you've had the longest tenure, so yeah. you must know. Well, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a range of things, and a lot of it depends on uh, the commissioner that you're working for. Uh, uh, for example, uh, I can give you a, a, f a fairly reasonable explanation. Uh, when I went to work for Brent Bolin, uh, who was a lawyer, Harvard Law. Uh, and also a master's in public policy from the JFK School. Uh, very thorough and in-depth, and uh, would, was very hesitant to ask a question uh, that I would offer him if he didn't understand it fully. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for six months or more, uh, you know, we basically uh, got to know each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was a lot of in-depth discussion about, you know, what why the question was material and what, you know, so from a legal perspective, mm -hmm. you know, we would spend two and a half, three hours uh, going over a bench <laughs> session uh, mm -hmm. set of materials um, and, you know, even parsing through testimony and, you know, mm -hmm. finding uh, different things. Um, he didn't have a, a solid grounding uh, history in this uh, regulatory world. He, mm -hmm. he came from the Property Tax Appeals Board. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of this was new to him, but he was a very quick study, great writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, uh, after about two and a half years, uh, um, I, it got to the point where I could write, for example, uh, a dissenting opinion uh, mm -hmm. for him, uh, a draft mm -hmm. of, of things like that. So uh, from my perspective, I learned a lot about his method of approach from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we worked re really well together from a legal and a policy perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there was one case, for example, that uh, was highly contentious and um, I can't remember the docket number, but essentially the issue was uh, I disagreed with his position on a legal basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and he disagreed with mine on a policy basis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we really, uh, he went with his position mm -hmm. uh, and eventually uh, the case went to the appeals court and was overturned mm -hmm. uh, in favor of the position that I had offered. Um, and he said, well, congratulations, you know. That yeah. takes like two <laughs> years to go through. You were right, I was wrong. And I said. Well, let's wait and see. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did go to the Supremes, and eventually he was upheld. So mm -hmm. um, that's the sort of give and take that you can have, uh, never mm -hmm. really knowing until the courts have had their final say about uh, issues of, of policy and legality. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a great experience in, in that regard and a, and a solid grounding for me. When Ed came on, uh, Ed had a history uh, with the commission. He was a former administrative law judge. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
my role as an assistant changed uh, a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do as much uh, in-depth uh, analysis, but uh, was more or less helpful in putting his thoughts together uh, mm -hmm. and, and framing things in the way that, that he wanted to. Um, and then fast forward to Commissioner uh, Squires, who was uh, uh, a former, worked at the ICC years ago in the legislative liaison role, mm -hmm. uh, but came to the commission with very little knowledge about uh, the uh, policies and legality of, of issues before the commission. And so uh, I took, again, more of a, a formal role uh, in that uh, sort of drafting mm -hmm. uh, position papers and, and uh, opinions and uh, uh, revising orders, and that, that type of thing. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was good uh, for me, a good experience in, in terms of uh, grounding to become a commissioner. Eventually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's fairly unusual uh, for, uh, but not unheard of, for um, uh, a commissioner to come out, come um, with uh, a background. Uh, as you mentioned, Commissioner Hurley had uh, some previous experience, mm -hmm. but you probably had the, the longest uh, history of experience then. Uh, being uh, named commissioner and with an, a background in economics as opposed to a background um, uh, in legal matters, but having been at the commission, what was that like then being in the commissioner's seat as opposed to being behind the commissioner <laughs> uh, feeding them uh, the yeah. question? Well, that, it's, does it's, that feel surreal at, it's, at first? It's quite a change, uh, particularly uh, sitting on the, the dais looking out at the faces where Mm -hmm. where I sat in the uh, back row looking at the commissioners for so many years. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's interesting to see the expressions of dismay, surprise, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sleep deprivation uh, in the audience. Uh, so, you know, that was quite interesting to, to see the faces and all the familiar faces over the years uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that are interested in, in what commission actions are. Mm -hmm. So, so going back, you um, you were um, uh, on commission staff, and and then had just become um, commissioner's assistant uh, as we were uh, dealing um, in the time leading up to the '97 Restructuring Act. Mm -hmm. So you were in uh, cost of service uh, and rates and rate design um, uh, issues leading up to that. Could you describe kind of um, what was the, I mean, we've, we've, we're having uh, rate increases during, um, uh, during the time leading up to, to the 97 Act. What mm -hmm. was that uh, time period like that led to the passage of the legislation? Well, I think for the most part, uh, uh, the, the high cost nuclear plants uh, were driving a lot of the deregulation activity. Uh, in, in Illinois at the time, and by the time that I had gotten into the cost of service and rates department, uh, I think 100% of the plants were already in uh, rate base. Mm -hmm. So the, the major issues about uh, used and useful and inclusion and, and cost, uh, those had, had been essentially resolved. Uh, now the question was, uh, and, and what I saw the most of in my early years was, uh, self-generation, uh, anti-bypass, mm -hmm. uh, and the issues of, you know, what's economic uh, bypass and uneconomic bypass, mm -hmm. and s the development of the, the rate spiral, and uh, how, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's an inevitability to this mm -hmm. as, as customers uh, used uh, alternatives to reduce their own cost. It, it brought the cost back onto others, which generated now I have an economic alternative that I can use. And so there was, you know, mm -hmm. eventually, and I think we all uh, that were involved in this saw that this is an unsustainable path. And mm -hmm. so something had to occur. Um, and uh, there was uh, a lot of work <laughs> that went into what that uh, method was going to be. One of the big uh, pushes was from uh, industrial uh, customers uh, who uh, had uh, high rates, but we had high rates across the board. Uh, residential customers were, were also paying some of the highest rates. But um, what, from a rate design perspective, how much 
of the of the cost um, was being borne by industrial customers versus residential customers. Were, were we unusual or were we typical in, in terms of the Midwest or, or the nation as a, as a whole? Well, I, I think the, the um, I think most of the very large customers, uh, for example, were operating under special contracts. Okay. They had uh, uh, enough sophistication to know that they could uh, self-generate uh, or build their own generation or co-generation facilities uh, at a lower cost than what they were being uh, uh, the standard rate was was giving them so uh, to the extent that 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 was occurring here it was also occurring in other high-cost states mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, the you know the Elcons or the Illinois industrial uh, customers were driving a lot of this mm -hmm. uh, because they were familiar with uh, uh, the process of how to engage mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so they they were employing it mm -hmm. to their advantage. You're a commissioner's assistant then when the 97 uh, act mm -hmm. um, or uh, starts in the process and then uh, when it actually passes and then uh, after it passes and all the proceedings that the commission had to decide on uh, as kind of an aftermath uh, mm -hmm. of that. Some people think once the legislation's uh, done, it's all uh, it's all uh, finished and, <laughs> and done, and that's when when uh, the ICC just gears up and starts getting yeah. uh, getting busy. But yeah. what um, um, you know, as you look back uh, at that '97 uh, restructuring act, what were the things that you think we got right? And what are the things, in, in hindsight, do you think we could have done better? Well, it was a, it was a tremendous uh, change, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the thing that I benefited from, I think, the most was a, a solid grounding in cost of service and rate design. Mm -hmm. uh, because essentially what you're trying to do uh, at this point is unbundle the, the transmission and distribution components from the production components of the electric side. And so having an, a fundamental understanding of the cost of service and how uh, costs are accounted for mm -hmm. uh, and what is functionally transmission and what is functionally uh, production, um, you know, that was sort of all new. Uh, and. Mm -hmm. There were different methodologies employed to, to separate theories of the FERC seven-factor test. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things came into play. I think one of, the, uh, one of the difficulties that the utilities had, for example, was as a fully integrated company, um, they didn't have to be particularly careful about their accounting practices in terms of what was distribution, transmission, or production. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, if they weren't meticulous in that, uh, then once something was moved off, uh, the company that was being created, the competitive side mm -hmm. of the generation side, mm -hmm. didn't necessarily want a lot of uneconomic costs <laughs> to come along with them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was this uneconomic component uh, that got bandied between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so from a regulatory perspective, you know, there was no reason to uh, have that come on to the regulated side either. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of arguments in that. Uh, there was discussions about proper accounting, whether it was tracked uh, accordingly, appropriately over the years. Uh, so I think uh, to that degree, having a better sense of... Uh, you know what the actual cost of service is uh, mm -hmm. to begin with would have been uh, a good starting point. Uh, the second issue is the the residential rate design uh, that had to do with recovery of the cost of uh, distribution and transmission cost, uh, recovering over a KWH basis as opposed to a, a fixed cost or a decoupled revenue. Uh, had we started addressing that issue at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, in anticipation of, uh, of a competitive market, 
then I think a lot of the things that are the companies are facing now with uh, with regard to cost recovery mm -hmm. and energy efficiency and renewables and distributed generation wouldn't be so much of an issue as they are today and will be in the next few years. Mm -hmm. And was that a carryover from um, you know the the traditional rate making and and kind of political compromises yes. of, of making it affordable yeah. for residential customers? So we want that fixed monthly charge to be as low as possible and and uh, the KWH charge to, to be higher than covering the variable costs because then that's more palatable. Customers with high usage are paying more than their fair share of the fixed costs. Uh, was that the? Yeah, I, I think it, not necessarily that. I think it was just a vestige of the old days when engineers took this <laughs> number mm -hmm. and divided by total sales. Okay. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. think that's in essence, that was the easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, 50 years ago when you had a system that was growing and expansion uh, of uh, service to uh, a growing suburban community, uh, that was fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, could, you could deal with that mm -hmm. uh, in that method. And, and again, the same thing with kilowatt hours. It was a matter of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, kilowatt hour meters were the only thing that we had for the last 100 years. And mm -hmm. so uh, there was no need to get any more sophisticated. Uh, it was not cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, as things become more competitive uh, and new metering technologies come into place now, uh, and with a decline in, in system growth uh, and a decline in demand uh, mm -hmm. overall uh, in terms of efficiencies, uh, that rate design no longer uh, is, is a functional. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I think we could have anticipated that uh, to a greater degree than we have. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the 97 Act um, uh, passes, um, and um, we have, um, you know, a rate freeze for uh, initially, uh, I suppose. Years. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it was extended. It was initially one, and then there, there was the extension. But then we come to um, the auction, um, and then the aftermath uh, of the auction. Um, where where were you at uh, um, in um, during that uh, uh, auction process um, uh, that was made? Was that uh, were you still at the commission no. at that point? So no, you, I left you, the commission in 2003. I went okay. to work for the Midwest uh, Independent System Operator okay. as a regulatory affairs manager and. I was with MISO at the time, but Illinois was one of the states that I was responsible for, and I was uh, engaged in that issue. I, I uh, participated in the, the uh, pre-auction process, the workshops that the uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner O'Connell Diaz uh, presided over uh, prior to the auction itself. So it was a it was an interesting uh, time, interesting mm -hmm. developments. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of political pressure uh, being applied and a search for uh, alternative uh, options that would lessen the impact of a uh, 10 plus year uh, freeze on uh, residential rates. Mm -hmm. And there was no option. Uh, mm -hmm. Essentially, <laughs> it it didn't matter whether it was uh, uh, a uh, load following vertical tranches, on an auction basis, or uh, contracts. It, it it was going to hit uh, customers. Yeah, and you could reasonably, you know, uh, look and say a, a, a twenty percent rate cut plus a, a freeze for for uh, for ten years um, would be there. But I think there was some expectation, you know, that um, uh, retail competition was going to take hold during those um, uh, 10 years um, and then um, we came to the end of that uh, time period and we didn't have um, uh, any of the Aries uh, offering service to residential or small commercial mm -hmm. uh, uh, customers. Um, so. The, you know that necessitated a process for how are we going to procure power for the default uh, customers. Right, uh, right. Uh, it sort of goes without saying that if you artificially suppress the 
end user price <laughs> by a 20% reduction and a freeze, uh, you're not going to have too many uh, effective competitors at the end of that period that are going to be able to uh, compete with that price. So, uh, you know, it's like a Kansas land rush. Mm -hmm. It takes time for those competitive uh, alternative providers to uh, set up shop mm -hmm. and, and develop a, a set of pro processes and, and uh, strategies to compete. Uh, and so, yeah, th there had to be some transitional mechanism to uh, essentially allow the, the real price or existing price uh, of power to flow through to customers and then allow mm -hmm. the alternative uh, competitors an opportunity to compete against that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we, we come up, there's an auction uh, that results in uh, large price increases. There's a kind of, a, you know, it makes headlines uh, again backlash. and again. Uh, there, there's a real political pressure um, uh, to, um, uh, to fix it, uh, to do something. And, it, and probably there's two turning points, maybe even before that. Uh, we move forward in restructuring, but California kind of um, uh, explodes, um, and um, I, there uh, were some states that turned back from the course of uh, uh, restructuring, yet Illinois kind of kind of forged ahead, so that was one turning point. Mm -hmm. And then when we have the auction and you see big price increases, that's another time where we could have turned back and, and moved uh, back towards a more regulatory model. Any thoughts on why we didn't? What was unique in terms of Illinois that we had um, the fortitude to just uh, continue down sort of the same same path with twists and turns? Mm -hmm. Well, California was a unique situation, uh, and it was an unfortunate situation the way the rules were exploited, uh, the way the rules were created, mm -hmm. um, and essentially forcing everyone into a a short-term spot market and not allowing for longer-term purchases. Uh, so, and you know, one of the things that concerned me the greatest about that was uh, the government intervention in terms of long-term contract. Well, I'll fix this. I'll I'll come in when the market is completely askew mm -hmm. and negotiate for ten-year contracts. Uh, and as soon as they did that, the price dropped to. Uh, the normal price. So you were locked in for 10 years of basically three times market. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, uh, to guarantee the contract recovery, you had to suspend customer choice. Uh, and so that effectively ended the, the uh, mass market or residential customer choice program in California. Illinois was different in that context in that uh, we didn't have the restrictions forcing everyone into the spot market. Uh, the auction was a three-year forward. Uh, there was an averaging of things. The, the implications of the Illinois market were uh, driven by the rate freeze mm -hmm. uh, and the impact of uh, these artificial economic sanctions, in essence, mm -hmm. against uh, uh, the price of electricity. And so there was no, there was no it didn't matter what regulatory regime you were operating in, prices were going to increase. Mm -hmm. Whether it was vertically integrated or, or market, uh, nothing was going to change. And essentially trying to put these uh, uh, puzzle pieces back together was, well, I think, nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, Exelon had divested uh, their, their gas or their coal plants, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so much had gone on in the decade uh, in terms of change of ownership and uh, trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together was, it was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea was, you know, how to, while the market develops, create a sort of proxy system that approximated a market price for electricity for the mass market. Mm -hmm. Uh, and allowed the, the market to develop to compete. And, and that's when we got the Illinois Power Agency um, and the, right. uh, the act that created it to, to kind of uh, shepherd uh, that process. Um, right, there were uh, several changes that were made. Uh, there was a political impetus to act, 
mm -hmm. uh, to look like we were doing something <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in response to the increase in prices. Uh, uh, interesting things. Uh, Marty Cohen came in as chairman, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. Ed Hurley was removed uh, as chairman and went to work in the governor's office. Uh, and the Illinois Power Agency was created. Um, things changed there as well in terms of the procurement itself. Uh, prior in the auction, it was a total load following product. Uh, and with the uh, advent of the Illinois Power Agency, it was a 10% uh, above system peak. So there was some potential mm -hmm. exposure to market risk. Mm -hmm. uh, if system uh, conditions got so it, it reduced price, uh, you know, in in that horizontal tranche mm -hmm. versus total load falling verticals, yeah, uh, that helped. And mm -hmm. in addition, uh, the recession. Yeah, I, I remember uh, Mark Pruitt talking about uh, buying standardized products, um, uh, and and uh, there, you know, there's a shifting of risk. So mm -hmm. in the in the auction that we had, we we were uh, requiring bidders to take on that um, uh, quantity Supply risk, risk uh, right. yeah. uh, of um, things, and and now, kind of the IPA was taking uh, on right. that uh, uh, that risk, um, and um, I think the original thinking in the auction was, oh, there's lots of market players that are used to risk mitigation strategies, and that won't be such a big deal, um, and you know. The, yeah, I think I think that may have been the case initially in the auction. The other was that uh, adding all the supply risk uh, created an opportunity, a margin, mm -hmm. uh, for example, for competitive suppliers to come in and and uh, uh, counter. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I think it, the idea was if you set a price as, as high, you know, put the risk every risk that you could possibly put in. Mm -hmm. uh, to the price, then it would allow a competitive market to come in. And, yeah. Uh, Are there any, I mean, if you were to look at it as an economist using traditional methods of like a Herfindahl index and, and things, certainly our generation market is highly concentrated um, um, in, uh, in there, but, um, but yet we're, we're part of um, MISO and, and PGM, so it's, it's uh, um, it, looking as economists, what do you think is the right relevant market to be, you know, so if you just look at it um, from within the state borders, you say, wow, market power, high Herfindahl index, uh, this raids alarm bells, but then when you look at it from an RTO perspective, um, uh, uh, less so. Where, where's the right, what, what's the right uh, mm. way to analyze those kind of market power issues well, I, I, I think now you're getting to the heart of the, of the matter, <laughs> and, and as long as we're speaking in hypotheticals, uh, it's, it's um, in my estimation, we went a step toward uh, development of, of a competitive market for uh, electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, we've not gotten there fully uh, by any stretch, and, and part of the reason is that the affiliate relationships between uh, the ownership of production as well as transmission and distribution are still still there. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example <coughs> is the natural gas industry mm -hmm. uh, where the uh, transmission of the natural gas product and the distribution of the product are all disintegrated Mm -hmm. And cross ownership of, of these types of things is not is not there. Mm -hmm. So you have multiple producers on the production side, mm -hmm. multiple consumers, and the regulated portion is the transmission and distribution, which is the right right way to approach. But the production and the cost of the commodity itself is totally deregulated. Mm -hmm. On the electric side, we we've, we've not uh, quite gotten there. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have affiliate relationships uh, and ownership issues between uh, the production and the distribution of the, of the commodity. And I, I don't think we'll really get to a competitive market uh, because of these issues until we, we see that disintegration occur. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, and, and we are moving in that direction with with uh, Ameren selling off uh, their their plants uh, to Dynagy. I'm not uh, sure the motivation was for the development <laughs> of a competitive market, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know that's one indicative of, of market conditions as as they currently exist. Yeah, with yeah. the wholesale price going so. Um, it's so low for such a, a long time. A balance yeah. sheet race to the bottom, and there are a lot of policy issues driving that. Mm -hmm. uh, not the least of which is is ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we get uh, the Illinois Power Agency, and and uh, uh, Mark Pruitt comes on as uh, um, uh, the first uh, uh, director. Good man for the job. And um, uh, I remember during the you know the, um, in the legislation. There, in the legislation, it says what the qualifications of that director had to be, and I remember uh, hearing much discussion of who could fit such right. uh, a, a, a description. Small pool. That's right. Yes. Um, so he comes on um, aboard, and um, um, things kind of uh, stabilize. Um, uh, we, as you say, we we get. Um, uh, he changed the way procurement um, uh, was done. Uh, we see uh, there, there was a rate reduction uh, associated with the legislation initially, uh, but then we see uh, declining prices kind of um, uh, from there. What, um, were there any other uh, kind of significant decisions that you saw as part of the IPA Act or, or kind of its aftermath? Yes, I, I think one of the one of the issues was that I think was overlooked was customer migration mm -hmm. to competitive options. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in particular with regard to uh, procuring long-term contracts for renewable power, 20-year mm -hmm. uh, contracts, which were proposed, uh, I believe, by the Attorney General's office originally, or the Governor's office that uh, came through the Illinois Power Agency procurement plan. Um, I opposed that uh, decision because I felt that uh, no one was anticipating what market changes were going to occur on the residential market. Uh, and without having a captive customer base, mm -hmm. example in California, if you're going to obligate customers for long-term contracts, then you have to have an obligated customer base. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means suspending customer choice to maintain that contractual relationship. None of those things occurred. So long-term contracting without a captive customer base, to me, seemed counterproductive mm -hmm. and problematic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, you know, I'd love to say that I was, you know, had that great foresight, but I don't think anyone anticipated uh, customer migration with municipal aggregation that we did see. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it has come to pass that the Illinois Power Agency is hard pressed to, to make those payments and maintain those long-term contracts with, uh, with the customer base that it currently has. Mm -hmm. Those things are, are subject to change uh, in the vagaries of the marketplace, but uh, I don't think that uh, as a stopgap uh, sort of provider of last resort, uh, that engagement in uh, long-term contracts is, is a way to go mm -hmm. uh, for that, for those particular purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and even though you say it wasn't your foresight to see what was going to happen with municipal aggregation, it was kind of on principle of saying, no, we shouldn't go uh, into long-term contracts when we don't know what it, w with the uncertainty, this right. was one of the contingencies that did come to, to pass, and you saw, you know, load migration right. uh, uh, out to through municipal aggregation and the IPA obligated on on uh, contracts that they uh, came to to fruition. Right. Maybe not. You, you saying you didn't see that, but on principle, um, you saw a lot of things. Well, I was that could I have was happened. at a conference uh, with Mark Pruitt and Marty Cohen on municipal aggregation mm -hmm. after I left the commission. Uh, and the three of us were speaking to a group of uh, municipal uh, energy acquisition folks about uh, this process of, of aggregation and, and what to look 
out for and, and what to be concerned with. And I think Mark, both Mark and Marty suggested that no one anticipated mm -hmm. the rapidity which with, you know, the customer base went off. And I mm -hmm. raised my hand and <laughs> said I did. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wrote about it in a dissenting opinion. But mm -hmm. the, uh, and I made comments at that time to, to those providers, the municipal folks that were uh, contracting for uh, future periods, uh, basically becoming many Illinois power agencies for their municipalities. Mm -hmm. uh, they were being lobbied by uh, other power providers for long-term contracting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suggested to them that they should <laughs> be very careful mm -hmm. because uh, because you municipal aggregates. It, it, the customers still have an option to, to leave. Yeah, they could opt uh, out. And so it's it's the process of the development of a competitive market. Um, having gone through it on the telecom side, for example, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, inertia, whatever the case may be, stuck with AT&T as their long distance provider for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but these days it's, it's uh, you know, so you, you don't know what the, the transition period is gonna be like. And mm -hmm. as a customer of, a, of power that now, for the first time in your life, you have someone other than the utility providing the power, even if it's under a municipal program, mm -hmm. um, and the lights still stay on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comfort aspect that, that comes to this. So, uh, well, this is going to work here. Why wouldn't it work if I shifted with another? So it's, I think it's an evolutionary process where people become more comfortable switching. with customer choice and switching. And in that environment, I think uh, long-term contracting uh, with that volatility uh, is a risk, mm -hmm. substantial. So do you think uh, municipal aggregation is, um, will that um, continue uh, to be the me mechanism by which we see competitive markets on the residential side, or do you see it as being maybe a, a stepping stone, as you say, for people to get more comfortable with, um, uh, with the idea of switching? Yeah, I, th I think it's a transitory mechanism. If, if you if you allow for a competitive market to actually develop, and I think part of that process is again uh, the integration at the holding company level of these of these companies. If, if we see all these things come together uh, and, a, and a truly competitive market for the the commodity mm -hmm. of electricity uh, develop, then I think uh, I think then. Uh, Aggregation is a is a transitory mechanism, but but may mm -hmm. remain in different uh, opportunities. It could be the University of Illinois uh, mm -hmm. has a uh, a program uh, for alumni. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of those types of things that that occur, uh, and uh, so the, you know those things can develop. You know, however they do, but. Uh, Certainly, uh, aggregation of some sort uh, mm -hmm. seems to make sense just from a purely economic sense. Uh, the greater the, the pool, the lower the unit cost, one yeah. would assume, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when I, I think about um, your time as, as a commissioner, you might think of your, your legacy as, as commissioner differently, but I'll, I'll take a I'll stab and you can, you, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can correct me, uh, but I always think of uh, um, um, a, you on a, a, a kind of a national uh, uh, scope as well as uh, mantra here in Illinois of talking about uh, smart prices. You know, smart grid needs uh, smart uh, prices uh, t uh, to go along with it. Um, now that we're kind of in, um, you know, the, the smart grid bill has, has passed, um, and some would say have passed two or three times uh, uh, of things. Um, and the question is, is it getting smarter? Is it getting yeah. smarter? Uh, yeah. So wh what would you see, wh what led up to the need for the, the smart grid bill? And then wh what do you see as the need for, for uh, smart pricing? Well, I think technology has, has caught up with us, uh, particularly with regard to the watt hour meter. It was a fine piece of engineering mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it served us well for over a century. But the unit cost of a digital meter 
uh, that can register not just total consumption, but a temporal aspect of consumption, when you consume. Mm -hmm. uh, it became cost competitive with uh, an analog uh, watt hour meter. And so keeping up with technology, you know, it's just allowed us to uh, register and communicate mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so the idea of paying for something, a cumulative bill, 45 days <laughs> after you consumed it, which is unfortunately mm -hmm. uh, what we lived with. It, and even that, is, there's nothing wrong with that. We do that on the gas side to this day. Mm -hmm. But we pay a market price mm -hmm. for the commodity, mm -hmm. whatever the, the cost of gas is in the, in the marketplace. Now, we smooth that by averaging it over a, an annual period or month to month. But um, that hasn't happened on the electric side. And, mm -hmm. and so the other reality is that those meters and that technology existed for commercial, certainly large commercial and industrial customers for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they've been able to, by knowing uh, the actual cost of electricity uh, in real time, uh, because they've been exposed to it by virtue of their metering capability, certainly in Illinois. Um, and you know as well as I do that the hourly price of electricity is not 10 cents an hour. It's, mm -hmm. It varies with time. So um, they've had the capability to address these issues through technology, energy management software, uh, shifting their own consumption uh, and production processes uh, to adapt to the price. And that technology, uh, the software aspect of it, uh, of energy management, is now becoming uh, part and parcel of the residential mass market capability. And so creating the infrastructure and letting the, re the residential market, which has the worst load factor from a systemic perspective mm -hmm. of industrial, commercial, uh, and, and residential, to sort of get, get this improvement in their uh, operations uh, is an enormous productivity opportunity. Mm -hmm for us uh, and to lower the overall cost of electricity. So a lot has to be done in order to make that transition mm -hmm. from a fixed price product that you pay for 45 days later to uh, an hourly variable product that, that you are completely aware of at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of bringing the tools, the software and the uh, and the hardware at the end user level to manage that uh, transition is going to take years to develop. Mm -hmm. For um, for those who would say we, we don't want smart price we don't want time varying prices it's just uh, a hassle uh, <laughs> for consumers they're not going to be wanting to watch their meter or um, uh, things to enable the kind of um, demand response that we'd uh, like to see to flatten out that load factor. What would you What would you say to to those folks? Do you think? I think it's a generational issue on the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. I think most of the issues that uh, I've heard uh, from the consumer side on this are reminiscent of what we went through in the telecommunications transition. Mm -hmm. uh, the reluctance to do 10-digit dialing I thought was going to kill some people, <laughs> uh, considering the protests and the marches, but we all seemed to live through it. Uh, yes, stationary had to be redone. Uh, but, but there are things that, uh, there's sort of a generational expectation mm -hmm. on the one side coming behind us with technology uh, and, and the politics of technology and how that changes and privacy uh, and the expectations of what technology uh, can do. And, and I think that it's, it's not something that you're going to be able to keep out of this marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's transformed every other uh, industrial market that we've, we've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing that I, I can see that's going to prevent that from occurring.
-hmm. in the in this industry. I, I think it's just going to happen. It's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. I think there are folks that are going to and have been successful at mm -hmm. uh, slowing down this process. The speed with which change occurs in this industry, as you know, is mm -hmm. glacially <laughs> slow. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it it will occur. Mm -hmm. I'm fully confident of that. I don't think there's anything that, uh, well, as an economist, you look at these markets as you as you transition them from, you know, natural monopolies to, you know, is there sufficient competitive capability here to have price discipline in the market versus mm -hmm. regulation? If there is, mm -hmm. uh, then there is nothing that stands in the way of that inevitability in my mind. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's sort of where we are here. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are structural things that, that can stand in the way, impediments like the mm -hmm. uh, affiliate transactions uh, and the holding company integration, but uh, eventually they'll, they'll sort themselves out. Mm -hmm. I hope, yeah. in my lifetime. <laughs> You, you mentioned a couple times, um, and I'd like to go back to it on uh, shifting gears away from electricity and, and uh, to, to uh, telecom. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, lived through the SBC Ameritech uh, merger and was um, uh, uh, involved in in um, uh, that um, in the way of uh, um, transition. And I guess were you. Um, uh, commissioner's assistant when mm -hmm. the when the decision came down mm -hmm. what what were the policy issues surrounding that in terms of the you know the the merger case um, and uh, the the focus of the commission yeah I think the uh, focus of the commission at that time was was consumer protection uh, to make sure that um, to maintain uh, sort of regulated uh, rate strategies uh, in anticipation of a competitive market not fully developing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was some uh, desire uh, to have safety nets in place uh, and to extract to the extent possible as many concessions from the, the merging companies uh, towards consumer protections and, and pricing uh, for those customers. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that was the biggest thing. No one knew how effective uh, and to what degree competition was going to take hold or take root. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, well, we've seen the transformation in telecommunications. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it speaks for itself. Yeah. A and yet, a as we're talking about affiliate transactions, you, you have uh, the um, uh, SBC um, uh, now renamed uh, AT&T with uh, wireless, so they've got a wireless affiliate, which is providing, you know, the, the biggest part of competition to the traditional uh, landline uh, firms, and the same thing in uh, Verizon uh, wireless being the the um, biggest competitor. Any thoughts on how they've still maintained their affiliate relationships? So as I say, they're wireless. Um, Piece, but they're competing against their own uh, themselves uh, on, on the landline side. That seems to have now worked and evolved. Um, could it work? Uh, it, has it really w uh, worked on the telecom side? Well, I, yeah, I think it has. I, and to the degree that wireless was uh, lightly, if ever, really regulated, mm -hmm. uh, and so and and you know the broader. Uh, scope of things in trying to compare the industries, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, telecommunications was essentially nationally regulated with the states acting as uh, process for the, the FCC, uh, essentially compliance uh, of, of federal rules. You could uh, make a decision which was nationwide. And mm -hmm. In the case of electricity, it's still done on a state-by-state -state parochial basis. Uh, mm -hmm. FERC has some role at the, at the federal level and transmission grid, but there is no federal agency that makes a blanket statement and, and this is how the market deregulates. It was tried, mm -hmm. standard <laughs> market design, but uh, mm -hmm. didn't go over too well. So there are some fundamental differences in that, in that you're able to, to have sweeping reforms mm. um, and 
it, it's, it's much easier to do uh, at, at that level because of the regulatory uh, and jurisdictional mm -hmm. uh, situation. The other thing that, that always struck me between and among the industries, uh, natural gas we talked about earlier was, mm -hmm. is uh, regulated completely different than uh, the electric and, and the same way with telecommunications at the federal and the state levels. But if you look at just industries and the digital transformation, uh, if you look at the computer industries, one of the least regulated industries, and look at the technological gains, Moore's Law that comes into place, mm -hmm. and you look at each industry and the level at which it's regulated and the transformation. So you have these guys moving at the speed <laughs> of light uh, and uh, uh, the most capital-intensive industry, the electric industry, uh, moving at the speed of glaciers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, You've seen it in the telecommunications industry. It was much easier to essentially deregulate that industry. Uh, the modified final judgment in 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing to remember was that AT&T agreed to that. Mm -hmm. uh, they did not fight it. Yeah. Uh, and so when an industry embraces change, um, it still took decades. Mm -hmm. uh, to make these <laughs> transitions, but mm -hmm. uh, again, if you see the transformation over the last two decades with wireless communications, mm -hmm. again, lightly regulated, mm -hmm. uh, and the development of that, and how the wireline industry has essentially uh, been cannibalized uh, mm -hmm. and is, is basically on its last legs. I mean, what mm -hmm. can you effectively deliver uh, over that twisted copper pair these days <laughs> that can compete. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's one of those things about platforms and constant change in the infrastructure uh, that uh, is at risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll shift gears again mm -hmm. uh, on you and, and um, uh, ask you about um, your time at uh, uh, Midwest ISO and PGM, Illinois is kind of in a unique situation of having uh, two RTOs. Uh, I, I'm, uh, maybe you're aware of um, uh, other states where, um, where this happens within uh, state borders, but um, we've got uh, two of the major RTOs, uh, both operating uh, north half of the state, south half of the mm -hmm. state. Um, uh, how is that um, worked in terms of seams issues from kind of a, an Illinois perspective. So if you put on your commissioner's hat uh, and and uh, from from Illinois, has that been a, a a good thing, bad thing, or just something to to work through? Well, it's it's uh, it's been a process to work through. Uh, I think Illinois' position uh, throughout the whole process was that. Uh, we saw no need for more than one, mm -hmm. uh, but the reality is that uh, when I was with MISO and they were looking, the FERC was looking at uh, the joint and common market and the capability of PJM and MISO to, f to functionally mm -hmm. uh, create a single RTO. It was, it was impossible uh, from a perspective of computing power mm -hmm. and cost. Uh, at the time to develop a, a system where you could have a single state mm -hmm. uh, and, and then have those uh, computer functions uh, solve the market. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just <laughs> impossible uh, from a cost perspective. And, and uh, now that may change uh, with Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it, it, it still exists. Um, there's stark differences between the two. Uh, most of PJM, if not all, is uh, uh, a retail choice states, mm -hmm. uh, whereas MISO operates uh, mainly in vertically integrated states, Illinois being, I think, the last market where competition is currently uh, open to, to the mass market. Mm -hmm. That is a stark change. Uh, I think Illinois remains uh, to these uh, split markets. Uh, and, and split RTOs. Ohio has shifted 
uh, all of its uh, utilities into the PJM market, uh, which is more reflective of their open access conditions. Uh, so, and from a utility perspective, it's had its impact. I think that uh, Ameren, uh, for example, you mentioned earlier the the uh, the sale of their uh, generating assets in, in Illinois. I don't know if you can call it a sale, uh, mm -hmm. essentially. <laughs> but uh, had those assets been in PJM, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they may have derived revenues from the uh, RPM market, from the capacity market, mm -hmm. that may have made them more viable mm -hmm. uh, as units. Uh, I think that MISO's development of a capacity market is too little, too late. Mm -hmm. uh, to solve that problem. So to that extent, structurally there are changes between the two um, and from a market perspective there are, there are changes between the two. And I'm not sure that uh, that Illinois is ill-served in being two uh, mm -hmm. RTOs. I, uh, it remains to be seen what market structure uh, from an RTO perspective uh, operates the best in support of uh, open access markets underneath them at the retail level. Mm -hmm. uh, so to that end, we've got a lot of experiment, experiments going on. We have ERCOT in Texas, which is still struggling with trying to be an energy only market, uh, whether they should develop a uh, capacity market. MISO's capacity market, which differs from uh, PJM's. Uh, so there's a lot of experiments going on, uh, but the reality is that the underlying or the, the broader market, the mass market, has yet to really experience a robust competitive uh, option out there, mm -hmm. uh, which I think at some point will drive the structure of the wholesale markets. I think at this point the wholesale markets are more driving the structure of the competitive markets and the development thereof, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Yeah. But I don't think that's sustainable either. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. If the competitive market is allowed to actually function. Yeah. Are there any other regulatory or legislative uh, um, issues that I haven't uh, asked you about that uh, you'd like to comment on? Well, I think there are a couple. Uh, one that has I've been following for some time, uh, particularly over the last four or five years, is the development of the renewable markets uh, at a state level, uh, a lack of federal policy uh, from a congressional perspective. There is a federal policy, I, th I think, supportive of renewable markets at the FERC level from a transmission perspective, but there's no legislation in terms of carbon uh, reduction. So I, I think the approaches that we're, we're seeing to address, you know, sort of the externalities of, of a fossil-based uh, system that we've had in place for years are problematic on, on a number of, of levels. Um, and uh, I'm not sure where this is all going to end up, except that I, th I think I can reasonably uh, estimate that we're all going to be paying higher prices <laughs> at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I think the pressures on baseload generation uh, are tremendous right now mm -hmm. uh, and caused by a number of factors. Uh, the recession and the reduction in demand overall combined with uh, increasing capacity investments into the market from renewable mandates uh, are putting pressure on uh, baseload generators that is unprecedented, along with regulatory changes uh, mm -hmm. like the EPA's uh, clean air rules and the mercury rules. So I, I see uh, signs uh, that uh, would, would seem inevitable at some point. Uh, if all those other things aside, the RPS mandates and the the EPA, uh, from a competitive market perspective, uh, reduction in demand uh, that we've seen in the Midwest in particular would tend to say capacity has to come out of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the least economic units need to retire. Uh, 
Uh, and to some degree, we've seen some of that, but it's hard to parse out if it's economic or if it's based on this or, or and mm -hmm. the politics of who's saying what for what reasons is difficult to parse as well. But the reality is that um, at some point, uh, Exelon has commented on retiring some nuclear units. Uh, mm -hmm. At some point, uh, baseload capacity uh, has got to get uh, revenues sufficient to justify their operation from an economic perspective in the marketplace. Um, to the extent that they can't, um, then units are going to retire. Mm -hmm. um, what are they going to be replaced with? And how do we deal with the relationship between intermittent renewable supply uh, mm -hmm. and what replaces the baseload? Uh, and that, in my mind, is going to be more costly than, than where we, we are today, mm -hmm. uh, without any doubt. And I don't think that's been well thought out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the way the structure of the marketplace is now, uh, you know, there's, there's not sufficient disintegration and there's not sufficient integration, mm -hmm. uh, I think, to make the, the right types of, of choices. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I look at Europe a lot to see what's going on over there. I look at Texas a lot to see mm -hmm. what's going on there because uh, Texas is a, a reliability council on its own mm -hmm. uh, and is not subject to FERC regulation. So they, they have the regulatory oversight from wholesale all the way to the retail end use customers. So the decisions that they make are, are sort of the canary in the coal mine. California is <laughs> always another mm -hmm. uh, good, good market to look at. But I think that if a market is contracting and uh, state governments are forcing capacity into a contracting market, uh, that has negative implications in terms of price mm -hmm. uh, and much like uh, price freeze. Mm -hmm. If we do this over a, a long enough time, uh, it's going to uneconomically force capacity out of the market. Mm -hmm. And that's the real question, you know, where are we from an externality and a subsidy perspective mm -hmm. in terms of the economic delivery of, of energy. And the, the key point is affordability. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point. Uh, it's interesting to see that from 2007 until today, we've, we've had some uh, reduction in overall wholesale market prices, but the end use price, uh, the retail price of electricity, has, has really not reflected the economic, the underlying economic conditions of, of the capacity markets, and mm -hmm. and that is troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be seeing reductions in prices that will allow energy as an input to pick us up uh, from an economic perspective and, and and bring us back. But that's not occurring. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, it will. Yeah, and and especially if we see time varying prices, uh, so you see that that that's uh, another uh, uh, aspect of of uh, I think potentially uh, impact, significant impact on overall pricing. Mm -hmm. If you start improving the system load factor, you're going to start putting downward pressure on the net asset value of the underlying production assets. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't bode well for, yeah. that's an additional potential uh, economic downturn for certain generators. Mm -hmm. and. So all of these things combine. I mean, if you look at the uh, efficiency mandates, for example, Illinois is 2% a year uh, starting in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, the Department of Energy has asked for a 40% overall reduction in uh, energy uh, consumption. If you look at the mandates and sort of the mandates for increasing capacity going into the market and mandates for a shrinking uh, cumulative KWH base, and, and potentially changes in the in the actual load factor, mm -hmm. uh, then you have to start saying at what point along that load curve are we economically above or below from a cost perspective. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think that sort of analysis has, has been going on. I think that people, for example, think energy efficiency is good no matter when it occurs, mm -hmm. whether it's economic or uneconomic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that so far hasn't made its way uh, into the thinking yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are 
times when prices are going negative. If we had prices flowing through, we could certainly affect uh, that and improve it, but it's not, <laughs> it's not working that way. <laughs> the prices yeah. aren't making it through to the, to the customers yet, and, uh, or in, at least in full. So mm -hmm. Lots to do uh, and lots of fun for a lot of the policymakers out there. Yeah. What, what, would you, what advice would you give to um, um, students um, uh, that uh, may be looking for, um, towards a career in, um, in energy particularly? Um, would, uh, is this a good field to, oh. to, to uh, get into yeah. um, uh, for, for their future, and how should they go about doing that? Yeah, it's, it's, still, uh, it's still an interesting uh, world. I think, obviously, the, you know, the, a fundamental understanding of, of economics, uh, monopoly regulation, uh, the economics of the firm, uh, are solid grounding for sort of understanding uh, how far you can go, how far you should go, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, an understanding of the markets. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about the differences between the natural gas and telecommunications and the energy markets and how they're regulated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so looking at things from a, an economic history perspective, mm -hmm. how did we get this way and why? Mm -hmm. If someone came into this, this uh, market and said, just comparing the natural gas, I see no real fundamental differences why these two industries shouldn't be regulated similarly. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, try to unravel, you know, 100 or more years of, of regulatory jurisprudence <laughs> on states' rights versus the FERC. Mm -hmm. um, those are the types of policy matters that, uh, that have to be, I think, unwound and, and uh, you know, does the Federal Power Act of 1934 still hold? Mm -hmm. uh, can we make uh, fundamental changes to issues of that nature? Can we, do we have the, the politics mm -hmm. uh, in this country to, to have a national energy policy with regard to carbon? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what should the, the marketplace look like? Why can't I do things with my phone that I can do in every other industry that I can't do mm -hmm. here? Why do I have to wait 45 days to get mm -hmm. my bill? Yeah, uh, and, and yet I find it interesting as you've gone through the, the different industries, you've talked about the institutional differences, wh whether it be from just uh, you know, the, the technology itself or like you say, uh, state versus federal how things have unfolded, those become um, critically important in your application of economics. Um, you can't just say, oh, um, competition's good, uh, regulation, yeah. that's, ba that's bad. Well, it, it's a lot more nuanced than that, given yes. uh, a lot of the institutional uh, knowledge. Right, if you, if you look at the attempt, uh, I, I think it was a laudable attempt, I, I think it was, uh, uh, the right evolutionary path to take of, of the FERC, Pat Wood, mm -hmm. uh, when he was chairman of the FERC, Nora Brownell, mm -hmm. to try and create uh, a standard market design mm -hmm. uh, for application to uh, wholesale transactions across the electric interconnects in the United States. That fell totally flat mm -hmm. from a political perspective, particularly with Western, uh, Northwestern and, and Southeastern states that were not interested in, in seeing uh, the development of competitive markets. And uh, at some point you have to count the number of Senate votes that you have mm -hmm. in terms of trying to make these types of changes. Um, and that's, that's the real question. Uh, where are we in, in the evolution of, of these types of things? And can we uh, essentially, from where we are, evolve to uh, the transitions that we've seen, for example, in telecommunications or natural gas market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for example, the, in the natural gas market, states have no rights over eminent domain for natural gas transmission. It's all FERC. Mm -hmm. The converse is true with electric transmission. States have the ultimate right with regard to eminent domain mm -hmm. uh, and jurisprudence over transmission siting in their states. <laughs> 
So, you know, these are types of things that you look at um, from an economic perspective and a market perspective and a structural jurisprudence and, uh, and say, how do we solve these kind of mm -hmm. terms? Or what, what does it take mm -hmm. uh, to solve them? And it, it goes beyond uh, sort of the economic and the political and the jurisdictional mm -hmm. and the legislative. Uh, mm -hmm. to a combination of all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, bringing the policy makers, the economics, the law, and all of these, you know, mm -hmm. issues together to try and change the history uh, of where we come from to where we should be. Yeah. Uh, Very good. Makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. So, still a lot to do. Mm -hmm.